Oh, I think I'll read this letter right now. It says, uh, before I get to the point. I, normally, I don't read letters on the air here, but this is what kind of interesting because the message that Christ brought and the message that I'm trying to deliver to you and other men who have come and gone, the message of freedom, it has nothing to do with color, male or female. It's a spirit. You must be born of the spirit. And every human being must be born of the spirit if they want to live, return to the Father. All who are born of the woman of the flesh must be born of the spirit in order to be free. It's not about color at all. Even your warfare is not about physical warfare. It's spiritual. It's a warfare happening inside of you. And that same warfare, it's the same identical thing happening outside of you, inside of others. Your daddy, your mama, your brother, your sister, your cousin, your friends, your work co-workers, your uh, whomever, right? It's the same battle. So uh, somebody sent me a letter. I'm going to try to read it. It says, Sir, glad that you are helping the family. You cannot build up and tear down at the same time. I have watched and listened to your show for years now. You have some good points, but you counteract these points with your negative attack on blacks. Your negative attack on blacks. You are not of God. You are misrepresenting him. Everything, every time you belittle your guests, your Sunday service is not about God, it's about you. Question, what happened to make you hate black people so much? Have you, have you improved your Alabama family members? You never discuss them. White people love you because you are expressing what they think. You say you grew up on a plantation, on the plantation. Well, it appears that you have your own plantation in bond. What the? <laughs> I know that you can do better. Try it sometime. Thank you for your time. Blah, 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 blah. Amazing. I understand it because now I understand the idol worship in other minds that you would think that I uh, am just trying to help whites because that's what white people think. But the message is about overcoming color. It's about overcoming culture. It's about overcoming fear. It's about overcoming mama. It's about a return to the father. It's about love. Not passionate love, but dispassionate love. Passionate love is a father state love that you receive when you became angry. You became like your mama. And all men and all women are just like their mothers. And that spirit, which is of the devil, is passed down from generation to generation to generation. The unfortunate thing is that too few people are too willing, unwilling, to be honest with the blacks that they might wake up and realize it has never been a battle between them and white people. It has nothing to do with slavery. It has nothing to do with so-called racism or any isms at all. But it has everything to do with the hardening of the heart. The heart made stone. Anyone that has anger has a, a heart of stone. They're of their father, the devil, and they cannot be trusted. They're wicked. They're wicked. And once you wake up to that, you overcome that heart problem of being angry. And then you see the wickedness in others, but you won't judge them because you would know that you were once like that too. You must return 
to the father. Why do you think mothers and grandmothers turn their children away from their father? Black men and women have been turned away from their fathers by their mothers, by their grandmothers, and by their idol-worshiping leaders. The last thing that the leaders of the so-called civil rights movement want is for the blacks to wake up. The NAACP doesn't want it. The uh, Congressional Black Caucus doesn't want it. Most of your average black preachers don't want it. The, um, uh, the liberal whites don't want it. The Republican or the Democratic Party don't want it. They need you to be weak and pathetic and down and out. That's how they control you. They control you because you're already brainwashed. Anyone that has anger is brainwashed already. Your mind is twisted. Your mind is of darkness, and it's misleading you because you have identified with it as you. You think it's you, and it's not. What a sad way to live. We have been given freedom but most people refuse to take it because they love their insane world. There was a, uh, a, a man at the fellowship yesterday. He was so honest, and, and he was like, I, I don't want to give up that. <laughs> you know, I need to feel something. And I understand that. That's the mentality of all people until they are ready to give up themselves to let go. You don't need to feel anything. You don't need to think. As a matter of fact, there's not one human being walking this earth that's ever had a thought of their own. You have never been your past nor so-called future thoughts. You are not your thoughts. You don't create thoughts, and you've never been your thoughts. You have never been your emotions, your feelings. Oh, but you hurt my feelings. You may be mad because you hurt my feelings. You are not your feelings and never have been and never will be in the past or in the future. You have never been your thoughts. I mean, your feelings, thoughts and feelings. Never be, been and never will. You take credit for it as though you think you have, but that's a lie. Isn't that amazing? Uh, I have with me holding on here Chad O. Jackson. And Chad is a Dallas-based entrepreneur and researcher. One of the greatest researchers, one of them, that I've ever seen. What the amazing researcher who star starred in the hit 2020 film, Uncle Tom and Uncle Tom 2. Amazing. Uh, Chad, welcome to the show. Hey, Jesse, thank you for having me. Yes, sir. I wanted sir. to come on uh, through video, but I'm traveling right now, so right. apologies for that. Well, I appreciate your time. Uh, today is a uh, uh, so-called celebration of Martin Luther King's birthday, and I thought of you because you did such an amazing uh, thing, research and putting together Uncle Tom 1 and 2, that I wanted to have you on for a few minutes to discuss this day. Um, um Everyone, conservative and liberal, is calling Doctor is calling today Martin Luther King Day a special day. What do you say about that? Yeah, and that's part of the deception. Um, and it, it's interesting to see conservatives uh, celebrate Martin Luther King in this day and to commemorate and pay homage to. When the facts are what the facts are, Martin Luther King himself talked about how he wanted redistribution of wealth how he wanted a universal income. Um, he believed and subscribed to Marxism. Uh, it's in his journals, it's in his correspondence, uh, his friends, people who he were close to, who were in closed door meetings with him, uh, confirmed and validated this. And yet conservatives, for some reason, uh, ignore all of that, and they focus on the dream speech and say, for that reason, he is worthy of all the respect, all the worship, all the honor, all the praise, basically worshiping him as a god. And little do they know that that I Have a Dream speech wasn't even written by him. It was written by 
Clarence B. Jones, Bayard Rustin, and Sammy Levison, all of whom were communists. And again, the reason I use the word deception is because the reason why a communist would use such pro-America, uh, such you know, um, romantic language, even though they don't believe in it, is disingenuous as far as they're concerned. But the reason they would use that is to position themselves and to posture themselves as if they are the good guys. They want to appear as a sheep, even though they're wolves. And they were so calculated with it, so meticulous with it, and they pulled it off so well, again, that they were able to dupe an entire generation of people into believing that Martin Luther King was a kind of saint. And a lot of people who were previously reluctant to, uh, to you know, give or to look Martin Luther King in that way finally came around, especially in the 1980s when you had Ronald Reagan uh, finally commemorate, uh, you know, the, uh, I think it's the third Monday of each January as Martin Luther King Day. And so it was a Republican president who gave us this holiday. So don't don't make the mistake of thinking that Republicans haven't figured it out and everybody else don't. No, Republicans are just as fooled as, as the left. It's interesting that... Uh... Someone like a Ronald Reagan, he had to have researchers, researchers to look into this whole movement before agreeing. Because if I remember, I think he was a little reluctant. He really didn't want to do it. He begrudgingly, he went along with it. But because of the attack, he really didn't want to go along with it, I think, if I remember correctly. Well, that may be so, but the fact is, like, people have to remember, during the so-called McCarthy era, uh, um, whenever they were questioning Hollywood celebrities and uh, government agents, so on and so forth, over their ties to communism, right? Yeah, a young Ronald Reagan was one of the people they brought in for questioning. And when asked about his take on communism and how communism shall be dealt, shall be dealt with in America, his response was, it was kind of a moderate response. He said something to the effect of, you know, I'm against communism. However, I don't believe we should do much to try to dissuade the communists because they should they have a right to be here just like anybody else does. And I have faith in the American people that they would be smart enough to not let communism grow in our country. But boy, was he wrong. Yeah. Um, he, what he failed to take into consideration, again, was the depth that communists are willing to go, whether it means infiltrating the government, infiltrating the schools, infiltrating the universities, infiltrating even the church, the depths that these people are willing to go to, in a sense, uh, cause a shift in mindset among our our youth in particular. But they specifically go after so-called people of color and the LGBTs and everybody else, <laughs> trying to make them feel that they're victims, that they've been had upon that this country doesn't love them, that everybody else is privileged compared to them. And this is the kind of psychological warfare that they that they use to build their army, again, with the goal of tearing down the country in its entirety. And people who are supposed to be on the front lines, like Mr. Ronald Reagan, um, again, uh, if you take a kind of moderate, kind of soft uh, t- uh, approach to fighting this communism, um, then what ended up happening will end up happening. However, if you take a strong approach, much like McCarthy was trying to do, um, then I think we wouldn't be where we are now. If we would have gone the way of McCarthy, if we would have gone the way of Barry Goldwater and listened to what they had to say instead of believing the media lies, that we would be in a better, er, in a different situation than what we are now. Yeah. You know, you mentioned something that crossed my mind as you were speaking. I remember when the homosexual movement started. They they wanted to like be accepted as a norm. And they would say things like, you're treating us in the same way you treat the blacks. You're taking away our rights in, in the same way you're enslaving us in the same way. And the black people, Democrats, de- those blacks who were Democrats and those few who were Republican fought against that. They're like, no, it's not the same thing. We were enslaved because of color, blah, blah, blah. And they, uh, they would allow the homosexual to connect their movement to the black, quote-unquote, movement. But oh. now I rarely hear the blacks speaking out against that. It has been accepted. What changed? Do you know? 
Yeah. So the thing that changed specifically, and I tell people this all the time, um, when you, when you look at black Americans from the end of slavery to around about the 1950s going into the 60s, uh, the average black child grew up with both their mother and the father in the home. Uh, the black man wasn't lazy. He wasn't complaining. He was working. He was taking care of his family, taking care of his children. Yeah. Uh, the mother, uh, she she took seriously her role as a mother, um, as a homemaker, um, as the kind of uh, uh, nurturer for her children. That was the state of the black community, and it wasn't like they didn't they weren't focused so much on their color. They weren't focused on yeah. you know being black. They were just focused on being productive, and that's thanks in large part to men like Booker T. Washington who told them, nobody's going to give you anything. Nobody's going to give you any handouts. It's on you to be responsible, to be respectable, to, to, you know, to operate as if you have some sense. And it wasn't until Martin Luther King came onto the scene in the 19, late 1950s going into the 1960s where he put this emphasis on color. And what he did was he exaggerated the conditions that black people were under. Because even though you had all these Jim Crow laws in certain places, um, a lot of these laws were being repealed. They were falling off the books at the county uh, level, at the state level, because for, for two reasons. One is because they were economically unfeasible, and two, because they were unconstitutional. And so they were falling off the books. And so, you know, we were making, like, real progress, not this fake word that the left uses today, but we were making real progress. Blacks and whites were getting along. And what the communists did, specifically through Martin Luther King, is they emphasized color. And they wanted to basically reopen wounds that have already been healed. And in doing so, um, they wanted to uh, basically put Americans at each other's throats. And so, as I say, Martin Luther King managed to move us from a trying race to a crying race. He taught us how to cry. He taught us how to beg. He taught us how to complain. I mean, did it in a very romantic way. He did it in a very glamorous way, uh, such to where he was able to get a, a holiday named after him. So, um, so what he did was he shifted the mindset where we are so infatuated with color. We weren't thinking about color prior to the 1960s, but we definitely are now. It seemed that America have uh, Americans have been conditioned with social movements uh, from an early age. Um, can you um, uh, speak on the impact of these social movements and their relationship with uh, the educational system? Yeah, so the social justice movement is part and parcel of American public education. Um, a long time ago, you didn't have a centralization of education. In other words, there weren't such a thing as public schools. Uh, people educated their children in the way that they saw fit which was conducive to the culture that they had. So Christians were teaching their children uh, their faith uh, through education. Um, The way that you learn to read was through the Bible. Um, And and also from the Bible, you learn ethics, you learn entrepreneurship. Uh, Basically, the Bible uh, was kind of the key. And it 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 wasn't until the 1960s when JFK signed legislation, um, basically removing the Bible from the schools. Uh, so first, you got to centralize the education, get everybody in one place. Then you got to push uh, integration of the schools so you can get all the black kids and everybody else in the same place. Then you remove the Bible. Then you push secularism, and then you teach them uh, who their heroes are. So you tell them your heroes are people like Martin Luther King, people like Helen Keller, people like you know uh, LBJ and FDR. You teach them that all of these progressive Marxist types are your hero who you should respect. And then from there, you teach them that social justice movements are a good thing. And then I remember when I was in school, I was in third or fourth grade. I was born in 1990. And I I vividly remember on Martin Luther King Day, or it was the day after Martin Luther King Day because we didn't, you know, we were out of school on that Monday. Uh, they that our teachers had us make protest signs about the yeah. issues that we care about. Uh, you know, one kid cared about the animals, the other kid cared about 
you know, global warming, which was a hot button issue at the time in the mid nineties. Um, all of these different things that we cared about and we made our little picket signs and then we marched around the school, uh, protesting for justice as third and fourth graders in the mid nineties. And so, uh, they're doing that same thing today where they're teaching our children to be activists, to be statists, to be leftists. Um, and so it's a, it's a miracle that a young adult becomes a conservative after having gone through the public school system. Our public school systems are deliberately trying to turn out status who, uh, who will welcome and vote for a, uh, a, a kind of socialist, communist utopia. That's, the, that's their goal, and they're using our children to do it. And mm-hmm. it's funny because, you know, conservatives have more children than liberals. Right. So we as conservatives are having more babies than liberals. And so you would think that it would be our values that are that are, um, you know, in control. But it's not. Uh, the, we, we have the babies. We send our, our children to the, their schools, the yeah. leftist schools, and, and they take it from there. That's amazing, man. And Uncle Tom, too. You break down how the black church was involved in the civil rights movement. Um, Prior to that, from what I knew, most black churches was about teaching about God and salvation and how to love one another, how to treat one another. What made made the black churches get involved with the so-called civil rights movement? So that's a very good question. Prior to the popularization of Martin Luther King, um, you did have organizations, uh, Marxist leftist organizations that were trying to get a a, a foothold, a stronghold in the Negro South, but they were having a very hard time doing it. Uh, Groups like the NAACP, which was started by a white socialist woman, they needed a black face to be the head of it. So they brought in W.E.B. Du Bois in order to convince people like, look, this is a black organization, even though it wasn't. Um, so W.E.B. Du Bois was all too willing to play the part. But the the interesting thing about W.E.B. Du Bois and his ilk is that they were all atheists. They were all intellectuals. They all thought that they were the, you know, smartest people in the room. And so there was a disconnect between them and the Negroes in the South who were church-going, who were faith-oriented, uh, who were strong men who depended you know, who who knew it was on them and that they can't depend on, you know, the government or somebody else to give them handouts. And so the NAACP wasn't able to penetrate the South. And so what what the communists did is they got wise. And Martin Luther King, who was trained uh, at a communist front group, um, um, who grew up uh, as the son of a pastor who had a front row seat to watching his his father preach. So he knew full well the kind of oratory, the kind of, of uh, you know, ebbs and flows and do's and don'ts of, of the black church. He went and got educated in a northern seminary, a liberal seminary. And then after he graduated, he came back down to the south. He went to Alabama, and he got to work. And so what Martin Luther King was able to do under the mask of being a, a quote-unquote Christian pastor is what the NAACP was not able to do as effectively, namely— uh, convince uh, in a very sly way uh, the black church in the South that this is something that we need to do. This is this is a good thing. This is uh, this is what you know is 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 our Christian duty and our Christian obligation. And he was able to do that because he had that kind of persuasive charm about him. Um, and again, you have to understand that the communists they've invested heavily into the social sciences, and the cognitive sciences. So they studied for years how the human mind works, how the group moves. You know, the individual uh, is smarter than the group. When you move as a group, you make dumb decisions because you're following a leader. However, if you're moving as an individual, you can see things that the group can't see. But you have to, in a sense, forfeit your individuality. You have to abandon your individuality and go along with uh, you know, in, in order to go along with the leader. And so that's what these, the, a lot of these churches were primed and ready uh, for the kill. And Martin Luther King was a master play that the communists used in order to, in a sense, 
infiltrate the black South. That's amazing. That explains why Margaret Singer, the woman that started this Planned Parenthood abortion issue, uh, she wanted to bring in the black preachers, and so she gave an award, I believe the first award, to Martin Luther King because he was already a communist liberal, and it was easy to just do that. He went along with it. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, Martin Luther King won um, the Margaret Sanger Award, and you know, he was very grateful and appreciative for it. You know? <laughs> so, you know, that that's another thing that puzzles me uh, as to why conservatives choose to praise Martin Luther King. I mean, how can you say that you're against abortion, but yet the person that you look to as a premier uh, kind of uh, exemplary individual on race issues, he himself didn't have anything negative to say about what Margaret Sanger and her organization was doing. That's something that, you know, a lot of conservatives should think about. Yeah. You know, it explains now why Coretta Scott King was such a liberal abortionist supporter and homosexual supporter and all those things because her husband was like that, and I had no idea. Yeah. I used yeah. to wonder why would Martin Luther King with this woman who was so into abortion, she just she was such a liberal. So I guess if the husband liked that, the wife would be that way too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that would make sense. And the thing about his marriage with Coretta Scott King is it was it was a kind of transactional marriage. He was actually in love with a a white woman who he met while he was in college in Boston, and he knew that it would be. I mean, he knew what his purpose was. He knew what he would go down to the South and do. And for him to be married to a white woman wouldn't be a good look. He would have a, a, a lot of trouble uh, convincing people of his own kind of heroism. And so for that reason, he chose to to marry Coretta Scott instead. And, you know, there was a lot of friction between Coretta Scott and uh, Martin Luther King Sr. Uh, Martin Luther King Sr. did not like her. Um, but they got married and stuff anyway. So. What a mess. Let me take a quick break. Let me go quick back to Chad. So, Chad, one final question, I believe, and that is, are black people today better off or worse off for commemorating Martin Luther King today? Uh, worse off. They're absolutely worse off. Again, that's indicative of like, who you who you worship says a lot about you. Yeah, who, who you praise and admire says a lot about you. And the fact that we praise, worship, and admire Martin Luther King, um, who preached and advocated for the government to be our end-all, be-all, shows that we <laughs> want the government to be our end-all, be-all. Uh, I can tell a lot about a person who, for example, has a lot of positive things to say about Booker T. Washington, because to that extent, you know, you know that, oh, this is a person who believes uh, in self-accountability and responsibility and character and in being an entrepreneur. Whereas somebody who, you know, praises and admires Martin Luther King, oh, this is a person who believes that they're a victim because of their color, that the government needs to act, that the government needs to pass laws to modify life for them because they can't figure it out on their own. Um, I'm not trying to be, you know, ugly or hostile, but it just is what it is. Yeah. Um, again, if, if not for the Civil Rights Movement, if not for Martin Luther King being popularized and heroized, um, then if black people would have stayed on the trajectory that they were already going down, because there was uh, real progress being made in terms of black literacy, in terms of black businesses, um, in terms of just black respectability, there was a lot of progress made from the, again, the late 1800s to the mid-1900s. Uh, what Martin Luther King did is he caused it. He caused a shift. He caused a kind of uh, of uh, you know switching of lanes, so to speak. And so, because of you know from that point to today, for the last 60 years, uh, the black community, the so-called black community, has gone awry and has veered further and further and further off course. To it seems like they're on the point of no return, uh, but I don't know. I think only God can uh, only God can change that. Right. Absolutely. One last thing, I think, uh, what was so amazing to me, that's in Ankatam 2, I believe, 
where uh, a lot of people have been using the so-called Black Wall Street thing as an example of racism and how the yeah. how the white people stop the blacks and now it's hard for the blacks. It's not known by most people, not just black people, but most people, that black so-called Wall Street was rebuilt after it yeah. was torn down. Can you explain that to the folks? Yeah, Black Wall Street, uh, which was an area in Tulsa, Oklahoma, known as the Greenwood District. Um, black success, again, black schools, black churches, black businesses. Um, it was a very thriving uh, uh, kind of metropolis in the early 1920s. And there was a brawl. Uh, they like to call it a massacre today, a race massacre. Yeah. It wasn't a massacre, it was a brawl. Yeah, uh, It was blacks fighting whites, black side, white side. And, you know, there were some buildings that were burned down, some houses that were burned down uh, as a result. Um, but what they don't tell you is the editor of the newspaper who started all this, whose name was Richard Lloyd Jones. He was a, he was a Marxist. He was a liberal. Um, he wrote an article entitled it Nabbed Negro for Raping White Girl. And his, his goal was to entice and build a white mob. He was trying to build a mob. What he was doing was actually quite evil. And it worked. Uh, you know, a, a white folks showed up to the jailhouse. They didn't. They demanded that the sheriff release his, uh, Dick Rowland, who was arrested uh, for allegedly assaulting a white girl on the elevator. He was later found innocent in 1921. Uh, you know, which is interesting as a side note because you know it's a time where we are told, you know, there was no justice for black people. Every time you know we were accused of something. Um, we were lynched as a result. No, Dick Rowland was found innocent, uh, due process in Oklahoma in the South, uh, because, you know, they followed the law. Uh, the sheriff himself did not release Dick Rowland to the mob because he followed the law. He was a Republican, by the way. Now, what what ensued as a result of the um, sheriff not releasing Dick Rowland, again, the mob was very upset. There was also a black mob there. They showed up with their guns. There was a shot fired. Nobody knows who shot the, uh, the first, uh, who, who shot you know their gun first, but there was a brawl that broke out. Um, after it broke out and everything happened the way it did, as you said, blacks got to work rebuilding their community, and they built it uh, back the way that it was, if not better. And it survived. And, and did very well from the early 1920s to around about the 1960s, which ironically was a time where Martin Luther King came into popularization. Now to the question of why is it that Marxists or liberals would want to see something like that happen? Why would they want for a black community to burn down the way that it did? The answer to that question, as Manning Johnson put it, is that communists did not want blacks to be successful by uh, by the process of capitalism. And the people who were successful in Oklahoma were, again, uh, utilizing their capitalistic kind of uh, uh, motives of, of being successful. Uh, the communists didn't like that. They wanted, for example, the uh, blacks to integrate with the communists, not so much with white southerners. And so for that reason, they would clandestinely uh, stoke kind of race issues, uh, such as the way uh, Richard Lloyd Jones did. Um, they would burn down churches, they would burn down businesses, and they would frame it as if white Southerners did it, because white Southerners hate blacks. Again, they were all they would always go out of their way to stoke racial division, because if you can build chaos, you can then come in through the back door and say, "Look, I have the answer. Vote for me." Um, you know, praise my heroes, do all the things I'm telling you to do, and we will fix this. We will, you know, show the, show the boogeyman who's boss. And that's exactly what ended up happening. And it's for that reason, once again, why we believe the narrative of Black Wall Street, there was a race massacre. Whites didn't want us to be successful, and so they burned everything down. We believe that Martin Luther King was a hero. We believe LBJ was a hero. We believe FDR was a hero. You'll notice that everybody who they heroized, uh, in the media today, here in 2023, have a leftist kind of ideology that they believe in. Why don't they? Why don't they give the same kind of respect and admiration to people like 
uh, say, for example, Thomas Sowell or yeah. Milton Friedman or Booker T. Washington or Grover Cleveland or William Taft. They don't. They don't. They ignore these people because they go against their agenda again to build a socialist utopia, a kind of tower of Babel. Um, that's that's their goal, and they're going to continue to praise the heroes and the so-called leaders uh, on the way uh, to getting there. And men like Walter William as well, may his soul rest in peace, but he had a, a major impact on the great things in America. But yet exactly. a lot of black people don't even know about him because the black liberals and white liberals have kept him in the background as much as possible. Exactly, exactly. Amazing. 100%. Smart stuff, Chad. How can people get the amazing Uncle Tom 1 and Uncle Tom 2 and whatever information else that you want to put out there? And will there be an Uncle Tom 3? Yeah, so Uncle Tom 2, I recommend that one. Uh, So the thing is, Uncle Tom 1 and 2, although Uncle Tom 2 is a sequel, it is a movie that stands on its own. It does. Um, You don't have to necessarily watch part 1 to get to part 2. Uh, part one, you can, you know, pop it in, you know, uh, during Christmas, make it a, a nice holiday movie. But part two is is good year-round. So I recommend part two, first and foremost. You can find it on Epic Times, uh, or Epic TV, I should say. You can find it on Amazon.com. You can stream it there by a DVD. You can find it on UncleTom.com. Uh, there are other streaming platforms that are forthcoming. Uh, but those are the the main places you can find it right now. Amazing. Uh, you can you can find me on Twitter at Chad o. Jackson, um, or or Instagram at Chad o. Jackson. So and, and then yes, there will be Uncle Tom three coming up. We'll be focusing more on blackness uh, as an identity, uh, how um, you know they're using blackness to destroy America and destroy the world, quite frankly. And so we'll be diving into that. We'll be diving into the so-called culture, uh, the media, the music portion of it, um, all of these people throughout history, Langston Hughes, Nina Turner, Snoop Dogg, who are perpetuating this narrative uh, that blackness is an identity um, that is in need of provisions, is in need of modification, is in need of special treatment. They peddle that narrative, uh, although they have lived and are living such lives of extravagance and, and plenty, they they continue to paint this narrative because it keeps people under control. So we're going to be fleshing that out for all to see. Amazing. Well, the one thing I know for sure, Uncle Tom, too, was deep. It was mind-blowing. It was interesting. There's not a boring moment in it, man. So you did a great job on that, and I hope everybody in the mama will continue to buy it and watch it and, and, and so they can get real education as to what happened and how to overcome it. Thank you. I appreciate you saying that. And you were phenomenal in in part one and two, by the way. Well, it was fun. It was interesting to be a part of it. (laughs) (laughs) So, Chad, thanks for your time, man. I wish you and your family a happy new year this year, the best year of your life, and that uh, I'm looking forward to the Arkansas 3. If it, it just keeps getting better and better and better. I know you're on the road. Be safe out there. People are crazy, and the weather's <laughs> crazy as well, so be safe out there, man. Thanks for your time. All right, thank you. All Appreciate right. It. Okay. Amazing. Chad O. Jackson, folks. Check out Uncle Tom 2. As he said, Uncle Tom 1 is nice, too, but Uncle Tom 2 is the ball, as the young people would say. <laughs> 